to be able to say that you went bone collecting in Africa when you were two weeks old or a few weeks old is to set yourself apart as being special. Louise Leakey is definitely a very special person. She belongs to the world's most foremost family of paleontologists, three generations of the Leakeys who are pretty much responsible for everything definitive that we know about the human species and its origins. But Louise is not just a paleontologist scion. She's a path-breaking explorer in her own right. She has found fossils in the Turkana Basin of East Africa that prove that human beings and the human species did not originate in a linear way from apes, but that we had almost four sets of ancestors in the past, three of which have died out. To take us through that story, to tell us why she believes we are responsible for the sixth mass extinction that this planet has ever seen. We have today Louise Leakey in conversation with Tarun Tejpal, editor and publisher of Tehelka. Please welcome them on stage. The, the measure of what Louise Leakey represents is to just understand that a grandfather, Louis Leakey, born in 1903, died in 1972. <laughs> When Louis Leakey began to do his work, in, uh, he was born in Kenya in Africa where his parents had gone as missionaries. When he began to do his work, it was an accepted truism that the origins of man lay somewhere in Asia. By the time he died, it was widely accepted that the origins of man actually lay somewhere in East Africa. A lot of that had to do with the work that Louis Leakey and his remarkable wife, Mary Leakey, did. Louise is the daughter of Richard Leakey, and the big word now we've got to get our tongues around is paleoanthropology. And that's only one of the first big words that's going to be thrown at you. So what I'm going to ask Louise to do is to actually speak to us not as very smart Indians, but as simple Americans, so that we can all understand. <laughs> so, 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 so that we can all understand what it is that she's, what is the story that she has to tell us Someone like me is absolutely fascinated. I, I remember I read the first Richard Leakey book called Origins when I was in college in 1981. I understood very little of it. It still lies there on the shelf with me. But I'm told and I know that Richard himself has gone on to rewrite that book as Origins Reconsidered. Louise was actually studying in, 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 in England and was just 21 when Richard crashed an airplane and was in, in, in due course to lose both his legs. They were amputated. Uh, and Louise was summoned back to this great fossil site called Kubifora on the shores of Lake Turkana. There are two very famous old fossil sites that the family has been associated with. One is Olduwai, and Olduwai was actually Mary's great hunting ground. Even though, as, as, as often happens, even though Louise was the flamboyant pioneer of, 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 of the whole hunt for the origins of man, it was Mary, his wife, 10 years younger, his second wife, who actually did some remarkable work and also had what is known as leaky luck in finding two very, very famous uh, 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 fossils that, that opened up the whole conversation on the origins of man. Uh, Louise, very simply, tell us the story of the origins of man. This is an audience that only thinks only as far back as 3,000 or 5,000 years. Take us back the couple of million years. For example, let's, let's start with uh, Proconsul Africanus, found by your grandmother, carried on a lap on a BOAC plane all the way to England in a, in a very smart deal done by your grandfather. Uh, it, it was a swap deal, like we do barter deals. The grandfather did a barter deal with BOAC, uh, British, uh, erstwhile British Airways, and uh, the deal was that Mary Leakey would be able to carry this great fossil, this Proconsul Africanus, which is the key, which he'll tell us a little about all the way to England to dazzle the people and start making this whole idea of paleoanthropology sexy and acceptable globally. Goodness me, you've given us a big family history in a <laughs> tiny little space of time and asked me an impossible question, which is to give you the whole story in, in one <laughs> sentence. But there you go. The, the family has, as you know, concentrated on, on finding the evidence of our past to try to understand what makes us human, what got us to being where we are today in terms of um, 
our species, Homo sapiens. And so, as you said, the conventional thinking was always to look outside of Africa. And it was really through my grandfather's absolute determination and conviction that he would find remains of fossils in East Africa that he finally succeeded um, from the work that they did at Olduvai Gorge. The um, <clears throat> fossils that you mentioned are extremely difficult to find. And I think I'm just going to, if I may, just touch briefly on the, the way we do this. And it's about walking over very vast areas, 25,000 square kilometers of fossil deposits there at Lake Turkana, covered in small pebbles and rocks and stones. And we don't just randomly dig a hole. We have to find a small fragment of bone on the surface, which we can then identify as a fossil, and we need to then decide to which animal it belonged. So the fossils themselves, most of them belong to all the different animals. The hominids, the human ancestors, are about 1% only of all the remains that we ever found um, from these, these areas. And so that's the backdrop. And also bear in mind, when we're talking about this history, that if you want to become a fossil, you've got to die in the right place and your bones have to be rapidly buried for you to actually then become a fossil and then your, fossil, your bones have to be brought back up to the surface again to be found. So if we're looking back in time, it's a very rare event indeed that anything is ever fossilized. It's even rarer that the fossils are brought back up to the surface and incredibly difficult then for teams of fossil hunters to actually be at the right place, at the right time, and actually find a piece of bone that they can then see belong to one of us. So we really are looking at tiny pieces of this very complex past, and we really have only these tiny clues in which to then try to piece this story together. And so when you're poorly funded and you go to Olduvai Gorge in 1959 and nobody thinks you're looking in the right place, and then they found the first fossil that proved that we have an African origin. The funding then opened up, and now, since then, many teams of people have been able to get back into these areas and begin to find evidence, usually very fragmentary, of pieces that actually then help us to understand this past. So, Proconsul came from Lake Victoria. It's a Miocene ape. It's about 17 million years old. It was thought to be a good example of what a common ancestor might have looked like. It's a long way back before we stood upright, had a common ancestor with the great apes. What defines the hominids from the hominoids is the fact that you are upright walking. And essentially, we would be correct to call ourselves upright walking, intelligent, questionable apes. <laughs> So, uh, uh, Louise, just give us a timeline. What are we talking about? Uh, two and a half million years? Okay. Five million years? At what point does this particular species that predates Homo sapien, at, at what point does the species, I mean, uh, what, okay. what area of your time zone are we operating right, in? So, when we had a common ancestor with the great apes, it's somewhere around eight to six million years. And that standing upright, being able to free your hands to use and make stone tools. They're these critical landmarks that define that sort of our ancestry. And one of them is, when did we walk upright? Second is, when did we actually have the ability to use stone tools and make them? When do we have this modern body plan? And then, when do we get this hallmark of our own species, which is this very large brain um, that, that really makes us and stands us apart from the other hominids that, that were in part of this story? And so, the further back you go towards 8 million years, there are far fewer fossil deposits. We know less about what happened, and we have fewer pieces of the puzzle, if you like, from further back. Where you see the origins of our own genus, Homo, this bigger-brained being, somewhere around about 2.5 million years it comes in. Now, it doesn't exist as a single species. There are several different species from which they've come from common ancestors. It's a, a tree-like diagram, if you like. Many of these things become extinct, but what we do know is that Homo erectus, which essentially is the first hominid to leave Africa, leaves Africa at 1.8 million years, 
And then you begin to find Homo erectus in places like the Republic of Georgia, where spectacular fossils have recently been announced. And a couple of weeks ago, there was a great um, discovery. So, so that tell was me, to come to these recent finds in Georgia, Homo erectus, is, is there a clear link that Homo erectus is, 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 is the same animal that traveled all the way from the uh, eastern coast of Africa and came to Georgia? So, just, so if we get Homo erectus was the first to leave Africa. Homo erectus didn't all get up and go. <laughs> Homo erectus was left in Africa as well. But the Homo erectus that left Africa is what became Neanderthals and evolved into other species outside of Africa. Back step again, as our species, we actually evolved in Africa from an African Homo erectus. So we're all African. And that is a really important message for everybody to understand today, and you're going to come on to that in terms of um, so the forget, diversity so of the world. Forget today, Hindus so. and Muslims. Yeah. To begin with, we are all we're Africans. All Africans. <laughs> <laughs> That's the important uh, message here. <laughs> yeah. But what is fascinating is that because as Homo sapiens we evolved in Africa 200,000 years ago, essentially, and we know that also from a very good now genetic record, and we can actually tell that story much better, and it complements the fossil evidence about our African origins as our own species. And we leave Africa only 75 to 70,000 years ago. As recently as that. As recently as that, as our own species. And the other point to mention is that until very recently, there were at least several species that coexisted on planet Earth. The fact that we're here alone today is an extremely unusual situation. No, in, in fact, that's, that's something I wanted to ask you, because there was a big controversy after the Laetoli footprints and, and Lucy being found by Donald Johansson, and there was this question of, was it possible that several species of, of Homo were existing at the same time? Why was that controversial? Why was it problematic to accept that several species could have been existing at the same time? Well, what you get taught and you're told that it goes from A to B to C in a straight line, and if you've been taught something, to then think that what you may have been taught was actually wrong, for some people is very hard to then digest and accept. So the fact that this nice simple diagram of how we came to be ourselves and that you know, we went from something that predated Lucy into ourselves, we now know to be completely wrong, and that there was a lot of diversity further back in time in the fossil record, and many dead ends, and many experiments in all different parts of Africa going back three, three and a half, four million years. Now, the footprints that you mentioned are which from... Were, which were found by your grandmother. The footprints are from a site called Laetoli, three and a half million years, the same year that, or the same date, they have the same age. Which of, could be a hundred million years here or there. No, I mean a hundred thousand years here or there, right? When you're looking at big time, a hundred thousand years doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make too much of a difference. But Lytoli footprints were in Tanzania. Lucy comes from Ethiopia. It wasn't a fossil that was found by a family. It was found by Don Johansson. Don Johansson, yeah. Probably a different species, we can't tell. And these footprints is a trackway of three hominids that walked across this volcanic plain, definitely on two legs, but one of the hominids was walking in the footprints of the one in front of it, like you would do as you walk down a beach. So for many years, that was the earliest evidence of bipedality, and now we, we've got a lot more fossils to fill in this, this um, picture. And so now there is kind of comfort in, in accepting that there could have been multiple species of homo? at the same time? There certainly were. If you look at the fossil record, the same year um, that Zinjanthropus was found, 1959... In, in, in fact, I also want you to tell us a little bit about the importance of Zinjan, Zinj, not just in the family, but what did it mean in fossil terms? Okay, so Zinjanthropus is essentially the, the f first hominid skull that was found at Olduvai Gorge in 1959. And that is this very um, small-brained, Nutcracker. Very, very large teeth, it's sometimes called the Nutcracker, nutcracker. Man. And it had a, a crest that runs along the top of its skull, which is where the muscle would attach to that powered these very large jaws. And for, at the time, Lewis, my grandfather, thought this might have been the maker of all of the stone tools that we're finding in that area. And it turns out 
that the next year they found the jaw of a different species that was much bigger brained and was therefore much more likely to be the contender of the maker of the stone tools. And it had a lower jaw as well, and that was called Homo habilis, which is handyman. And so we have nothing to do, our past, with the Zinjanthropus type、uh, fossils, the big toothed beings, but we come from a stock of the bigger brained, small toothed、um, uh, genus called Homo. Now, that was called Homo habilis. And there's been a large push to try to identify whether Homo habilis actually exists at the same time as Homo erectus, or did they have a common ancestor? And so the fossils that we found from Lake Turkana and also from Olduvai have helped us to try and piece that story together. And so we know ourselves to have come out of Homo erectus. This recent fossil from Georgia states. That actually all the different species that you're finding in Africa are of one group that you would call Homo erectus. If you look at the same theory that I said, where you've been told it's not the case, many people will find that very, very hard to accept. And I'm sure that we're finding a lot of regional variation with the, the group at large. But what really defines the species? And so you've got to actually say, well, That character is very distinct from another, and therefore you have two different species. It's very hard to do when you're dealing with small fragments. In fact,、bone. I was going to say that. Give, give this audience an idea of how do you read complex paleo environments by just looking at pieces of fossilized bone? How does that work? Well, there's a lot that you can do with. Small pieces of fossilized bone. There's a lot more that you can do by looking at the context that these bones were so preserved. So the geology comes in. So into the、place? geology is absolutely, absolutely essential, not only for dating, where we actually date the volcanic ash horizons that the fossils are sandwiched between. So if they are above a known dated horizon, they are younger, and if they are older. They would have fallen below a volcanic ash horizon. So the geology is extremely important. You can understand the, the envir- paleo environments from the sediments in which they're preserved, in whether they're rivers or they're lakes or whether they're evidence of grasses, and also to a large extent all the different animals that they're preserved with. So if you have Water-loving antelopes, you know that there were big rivers, or there were monkeys that were grass-eating monkeys, or there were elephants that were browsers, eating a lot of the forest. And you can do a lot of this analysis also from looking at isotopes within the teeth of these different animals. So there are many ways to look at the past, and it's not just from looking at the teeth. Or the bones of these things, which are, to a certain extent, quite also limited. Also, quickly, I'd love you to give our,、uh, all of us an idea of the actual process by which、uh, the, the the fossil is found, and then pieced together. For example, I know some of the key skulls have emerged in 300, 400 pieces, and then been painstakingly pieced together to to kind of put. It's like putting a huge puzzle together. So yeah, so it really is like looking for a, an earring that you've lost in a. In a car park, I mean, you're looking for tiny pieces of bone. When something's found, and this I must add is that we're using teams of fossil hunters that are actually drawn from local communities up there, so the fossils translate into jobs, and they're extremely good at at finding things,、um, and also knowing to which animal or which body part they belong. So when something's found today, it's marked with a little pile of stones about a meter away, so that The little kids that are running around herding their goats don't come and pick things up. So you sort of mark it slightly further away from where it was found. A GPS fix is now taken. Digital photograph is now taken. So I can be sitting here, and they could be sending me pictures of what was、out. found in the, you know, at, at Lake Turkana. And then, of course, when we want to collect something, we come in and we dig it up very carefully with little dental picks and brushes and hardener, and we take a lot more detailed notes. These fragments are then put through these screens, and you're, you're sieving away, looking for fragments again of bone, separate it from all the rock and the earth. That sieved material is washed and it's re-screened, and then you've got bags of little bone fragments, some of which belong to the fossil and some that don't. 
and you then sort through all of that, and you then try to piece together from the pieces that you have as much of the actual fossil that you have before you can then study it and uh, hopefully publish it and find that it's a, something and, of significance. And the dating techniques, because you're talking about millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years, how do you date roughly the age of a fossil? I mean, there used to be the carbon dating, but I know that went out of... And then there's something no. called argon dating. What is it now? How, uh, well, is there a f dating technique that is you, more accurate? The, the organic content of fossils is totally gone. It's totally mineralized. You, you can't get any organic content out of the fossils from Lake Turkana, per se. But as I mentioned earlier, we, we rely very heavily on datable volcanic ash horizons. And carbon dating really only allows us to go back some 50,000 years or so reliably. It's too recent to be helpful to us. But we use a similar radiometric decay um, approach to actually use potassium argon and date then the feldspar crystals within pumice stones from these volcanic ash levels that we can then place the fossils above and below. But these ash horizons have got very distinctive chemical signatures, so you know that they belong to a, a certain eruption and you have known dates for those. So you may find a, a volcanic ash layer here and another one far away in Ethiopia, and you can then tie them and say that they actually belong to the same volcanic eruption. And so without the geologists and without this window into the past, we, we would be in a very tricky place. It's absolutely essential to know where we are with the dates. From the time Darwin published his uh, world-changing study in 1859, there's been this kind of hunt, and I know your family's been part of that, for the missing link. <laughs> what is this whole missing link? And what is it that we are looking for? What is it that we are hunting for? I don't know what the missing link is, because there are so many missing links. <laughs> and there really are so many questions that we still have, and we, we still need to find fossils to fill in those gaps. Give I us an idea of a few of these big questions that paleontology is pursuing. I think that the question surrounding early Homo and what really constitutes that species is a really big one. I think that's why we've been focusing so much of our efforts into complementing the fossil collections that we have there. Um, and it, it really is absolutely essential to understand that because it's what predates us. I think also that will be more and more interesting is now concentrating our efforts looking at the last 200,000 years, where we, we really do have a tremendous record now from, from the genetic approach, and so that we can actually then look at that wave of human migration that's out the, as it leaves Africa. Now, that, of course, isn't the work of ourselves and the fossils, although we do have from deposits in southern Ethiopia and also Lake Turkana a huge number of fossils now that are of that time frame, 200,000 years. And it really is the beginning of us. And I think to be able to marry the two with the genetics and the fossils is going to produce a really interesting insight into that time frame. So, so tell me, Louise, what, as knowledge stands today, how far back does the first Homo sapien, as we know ourselves, how far back does the first Homo sapien begin to show, him, show, it, show himself or herself on the landscape? The African landscape, it shows itself at about 195,000 years, years ago. ago. And the genetic story all points so, to, so to... Quickly, 195,000 years ago, what would be, as, we, as knowledge stands today, what would be the contours of this ancestor of ours? What would he be like? What, was it, what would his life be? Well, he would look the same of, as ourselves. He would have been in Africa. Therefore, one would assume, because of the nature of the high sunshine, he would have been a dark-skinned um, being, and intelligent with language, being able to make fairly sophisticated tools. There would have been, again, a number of different groups of this species that would have been doing different things in a landscape. And as, you, as these groups migrate and spread, they were obviously utilizing the landscape in different ways. Um, 
you know, some may have been hunter-gatherers, fishing people, you know, all the rest of it. So you can, you can begin to pick up evidence of their behavior from some of these deposits as well. At this point, do we assume that it would be a single homo species? Well, we know if, as a, it, we came from that one, one group, and that one group or that common ancestor to homo sapiens as ourselves emerged around about the, sort of the ancestral, the, the eve, if you and, like. And do we have any understanding of why the other homo species... Die out? It, yeah, got, went, ran, ran extinct? Well, but either they get pushed out because of changing climates and habitats. So the Neanderthals, for instance, which were in, in Europe, climate changed to the effect or, or, so that it was no longer beneficial to that group to be a cold adapted or you had groups of humans other, like ourselves coming in and out competing them. There is evidence today, if you look at the genetic record, that European species um, mixed, interbred with Neanderthals and that all modern Europeans seem to have 2% DNA that's shared with, with Neanderthals, which is of interest as well. <laughs> but this is another long story, and I hear the bell's just gone, I and I want to make that, sure you that's know That's pleased a lot of <laughs> Asians here. <laughs> what's, what's, is, do we have any understanding of, say, the South Asia story in terms of the, the fossil record? So, what, if you look again at the, the fossil record, you're finding evidence of Homo erectus in, in China as well, and in Indonesia too. Um, as it spread across the, the, gl the globe around about 1.8 million years. There were pockets of species that again got isolated from that. You've got the, from DNA, a population from Denisova in southern Siberia. And Asian populations seem to share some 5% DNA with that species of isolated hominid. But again, these are fascinating things that are now coming out from looking at the genetic story of our past. There's much too much to talk about. I hate this conference because all you the interesting conversations have to be cut short. Uh, but I'm going to quickly ask uh, Louise about what she's doing now. I know the family has moved into conservation in a big way. Richard, her father, has been instrumental in stopping the ivory trade in, in, in Kenya and has been... Uh, it's not stopped. <laughs> and uh, in, in, in fact, Mary Leakey, who is arguably one of the greatest paleontologists ever, her grandmother, at one point did tell Richard in, I think, the late 1980s that ac conservation is even more important than hunting for fossils. This is where we are at. They really believe as a family that the future of, of the planet is deeply endangered by the lifestyles of the modern world. Uh, I just want you to quickly wrap up by telling us, who is this? <laughs> so one of the things I'm really trying to do today is to allow kids to get their hands on models. So I've built an interactive lab online. It's at africanfossils.org. If you look at that website, you can actually go in and get the stories behind the discoveries of many of these fossils. It's an interactive site, so you can actually turn things around online. But you can also download the files to allow you to 3D print small miniature models of these skulls, as well as to then be able to cut out pieces in cardboard, throw away cardboard boxes, and then assemble these skulls in classrooms around the world. Because I do honestly believe that handling models and trying to draw people into That's the cool. past. <laughs> yep. Who is this guy? Uh, this is actually a fossil called 1470. But by handling models... Found, found by Richard. Richard Leakey yeah. in 1972. 1972, yes. <laughs> but I think by handling the models, it then forces you to stop and ask the question about why do these things look so different and should ignite an interest in people across the world to actually stop and think and look back and say, where did we come from? So. Fantastic. <laughs> Louise, that was fantastic. Great to have had you with us. Thank you.